If you want to learn how to gain insights you can act on and solve business problems with data, all while building a data-driven culture at your organization, sign up for Pragmatic Institute's new course, Data Science for Business Leaders. Find out more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. Welcome to Data Chats, a podcast by Pragmatic Institute and the Data Incubator, where we tackle data topics and trends with experts, industry leaders, instructors, and alumni. I'm your host, Chris Richardson. Today, I'm sitting down with Lee Feinberg, the president of DecisionViz, a management consultant company specializing in data literacy and data visualization. DecisionViz has been a certified Tableau Software Services partner for over a decade. I'm thrilled to be speaking with Lee right now. Lee, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit more? Say maybe a, a little bit more about your background and then we can get right into it. Yeah, sure. It's great to be here. And uh, I'm always looking to share new ideas with folks out there and, and really help them make their work better. The big idea that I, I think about beyond data literacy and data visualization, because those are things that you can do and get good at. But once you've done that, where does it get you? And so I think about this idea of creating a trustworthy army of decision makers. That's really what companies want in the end, is people who can make good decisions. Mm -hmm. And these are things that can help them get better at doing that. It's not all the things they need, but it's part of the skill set that they need to, to develop a lot more to be successful today. Yeah. And you come at it from an interesting background. Do you want to say a little bit more about your training, maybe like formally, and then also what you've established? Because it's, uh, as you were starting to tell me before we recorded, I think it helps put perspective into this. Yeah, it's been a, a bit of an interesting road. And it's not like many careers, you haven't necessarily thought that you would end up in a certain spot. It wasn't planned. I actually thought or started as a my career as an engineer through schooling and realized pretty quickly that I couldn't do that for my career and was enamored with the, the marketing and product management work that was going on around me. And so just was able to shift into some of those roles over the years. And eventually a lot of that led into the work that was starting on the internet. And so I got involved with that. And then that kind of got me into working with data. And I, I really became interested in what all of that meant. I mean, of course, everybody worked with data, but it was becoming very different with the advent of, of the web and being able to collect a lot more information on people. And so it all fit together because I have a very logical way of thinking about things being an engineer. And so having kind of the marketing product management side and then the data and engineering side kind of all merged together very well. And, and eventually one day about 15 years ago, working on this stuff, I, I just kind of had this epiphany is probably a little bit of a strong word, but I just had this idea of, you know, what if we just looked at this problem, not as how do we make better charts or how do we make better dashboards, but what if we treated the work as building a product and we're delivering this as a product, it really changed my perspective because you have to start thinking about obviously who's the customer, what is their real need? Why do they want it? And then what do they do once they have it? You know, did the product really work for them? And, and that's a big piece we could talk about later that's mm -hmm. missing from the equation right now. It, it's something that uh, I think people really start to need, need to concentrate on as well as just getting better at the, the base work. Yeah, I mean, I want to dig into a lot of what you've just started to mention, but maybe we can start with data visualization. So decision viz helps people do things that they couldn't or don't necessarily know how to do. What are some of those things? I mean, I think we all kind of have an idea of what data visualization is. And unfortunately, I think everyone feels like they can do it. And then they realize that, no, actually, there's some things missing. There's some things we need help with. What are those kinds of things when you're consulting? Yeah. So let me use an analogy to start with that. So I think it will set the stage well. So imagine that I teach you Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. Everything about Microsoft Word, you are an expert. You know every function, feature, uh, but you don't know anything about English or whatever your native language is. And I just, now you have Microsoft Word. You can't really do much with it. 
-hmm. or what you try to do won't be very good, probably. And I find that's what's happening and has happened for a long time in our world, which has evolved greatly when you think about working with data. In the early days, maybe you had only Excel and then PowerPoint and Keynote, and, and then it started to evolve and then Tableau changed the model. And then there's been followers after that, but they just give you the software. Mm -hmm. And maybe they, maybe they train you some a bit on the software, but that's it. They don't actually give you the knowledge about what I call the language of visualization. What is it, you know, how do pieces work together? How does the brain react to visual information? And it's not just about best practices. It's how do you know what choices you're making in the software are good choices? And one of the problems along with that is that most software lets you make bad choices. Uh, you can do things technically that are possible, but they're not good. But some people might say, well, let me do it. So it must be okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Right? It, it's almost like you need a spell checker or a Grammarly for, for the software to say, are you really sure you want to do that? But yeah. that doesn't exist right now. <laughs> well, that would be really helpful. But also, I guess what, what that brings up, right, is that there's not always a clear answer. You know, ideally, even though it gets complex, grammar has correct and incorrect usage, right? There's, there's not necessarily the same thing in visualization. So what what are some of the things that we can look for? I mean, what is maybe we can start with some of those clear mistakes, right? Like, you know, misleading information or really problematic charts. Like maybe we, let's dig into that. And then I want to start mm -hmm. getting into more nuance. So what are, what are some of the big flaws that would have a, a big red uh, squiggly line underneath if we had that? Yeah, I've actually thought about creating a uh, an editor language for visualization, you know, like they have all the markups when you're mm -hmm. editing a, a, a transcript. But, you know, I'll just use this as an example that I think is pretty familiar to people. The stacked bar chart, if you're familiar with that idea, is something people use all the time. And when you start to dig in and say, well, why did you choose that? They give you a long list of answers. Well, I can see the trends and I can see which pieces are bigger than other pieces. And I can see how the total performance was for whatever, maybe a time period you're looking at. Mm -hmm. And so to make all those things potentially visible, you have to use a lot of different pieces. You have to use color and size and the more of those components of the, and that's what I call the grammar. So size, color, shape position, things like that. Those are, that's the grammar of visualization is the more you use that, the more complicated it gets. And in reality, all of those things that they want to see are not really visible within that chart because they're trying to answer so many questions with one visual. And that's where people get into trouble is thinking they can do that. And it really isn't possible to get all of that information out. So once you start to understand that nuance, you start to really break up a chart like that. And the question is, well, how do you break it up? And that's where you get into the rules of visual grammar. So, okay, if I want to do this simpler, or I'm trying to answer a different question, how do I morph what I have? And there's a process around that. It's not just pick another chart, mm -hmm. We've developed the framework to help people step through that in a more logical way. Again, so they understand the decisions they're making when they're writing visually rather than just saying, okay, well, I'll just pick a different chart. That one looks good, but you might still have the same underlying problems that you're trying to, to, to get away from. Yeah, that's, that's a good point too, because I think anyone who uses even just Excel, right? There's a bunch of options for different charts. That seems to be the decision point, right? Is this going to be a pie chart or is this going to be a line graph? And then that seems to be the decision to make. What would you recommend then people start thinking about maybe before, maybe after they make the decision of what kind of chart? Yeah, there's actually a key point here. And I came up with this little catchphrase, intent before content. And all that means is figure out what you're trying to communicate. And then you can figure out what chart you want to use. And then you can figure out what data you need. And that's a key thing too, because really data comes a bit further down in the path in the models that we use. Whereas most people, it's it's data first, right? It's data visualization, it's data literacy. And really it's like visualization. What do you want to show? 
literacy. How do you want to write and read? And then the data comes in later. It's, it's there to support what you're doing, but it's usually the first thing that people work on. And we have to change their thinking and their approach to, to flip that, which is, which is not easy. But that idea helps if you set the idea that you want to communicate clearly, then you should be able to design a visual that represents that. And so it's, I kind of call it making a straight line into somebody's brain, right? So they see the what the mm. message is, they see the picture, and it all fits together quickly. They don't really have to spend or shouldn't have to spend much time studying the visual. The idea should come across pretty quickly, right? You don't want people to sit there and study it. That's not the point. It should be quick. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a good point. It actually makes me think there's maybe we can separate that into two main areas, right? There's the the data visualization that comes when you're trying to interpret it, right? Like, so you're, you're maybe monitoring changes, or you may be trying to understand what's happening. And that you don't know your message, because you're just, you know, you're looking at the data for the first time, perhaps, or you, or new data is coming in. And so there's the visualizations people might be using for those where they definitely don't have a message that they want to share, necessarily. And then there's the final sort of presentation when you're, you know, sharing information with stakeholders, and then you clearly should have a message, although, you know, the worst presentations always, <laughs> that's what's lacking, right? You can dress it up as much as you like, but you need a clear message. Are there different ways to visualize or to think about visualizing if you're exploring data versus if you're trying to share a clear message with people? Yeah, I think you're right about that idea that there's really a split. And I'll, I'll get into another aspect of that, which is something else I, I were wrestling with. So the first part is if you're just doing an exploration, if you're doing an analysis, let's say for the first time, you just have a set of data and you're going through it. What you do, as long as you understand it, that's fine. Hmm. But you can do whatever is comfortable for you, however it works. You're the audience in this case. So you can use very comp, you might use something very complex to start digging in and understanding it because you're capable of doing that. But when the audience flips and you have to now take what you've learned, a lot of times people just, they'll just take what they used and show that, right? So, and now you've got a completely different audience who number one might not have even been familiar with the data yet, right? You just got into it. And then you might show them things that are not familiar to them visually. So it's a real struggle. You're making it very difficult for somebody to, to grasp onto that. And then usually what happens is the meeting deters, right? The wrong way. Now you have to explain the chart. Mm -hmm. You don't want to spend time doing that. You're there to, to have a discussion about what you've learned. And so it's making that flip from a net between your analysis and delivering the message to a completely different audience. And people, it takes time. Right. If you've made, if you've done your analysis and now you have to create something different for that other audience, it takes time. It takes work. It takes effort to do that. And a lot of people feel, oh, I don't have time to do that. So I joke, it's like, well, you have, you don't have time to do it the right way, but you have time to do it again. Cause you know, you're going back to the drawing board when you go in the meeting and they say, I don't understand this. Come back later when you can explain, you know, yeah. so you go back and redo it. So you still end up using more time than if you just done it the right way the first time. So it's, it's kind of crazy how people think about the displacement of work and what they're, what they're really doing. Yeah, that's, no, that's a great point, right? If, if you, if you do a meaningful visualization early on, it'll save you time, even though it'll take perhaps more time. Although ideally, I, I think we all get better at this. I think one of the issues is that, you know, as I hear you saying, you know, talking about the grammar of data visualization and, and becoming more data literate, I think there's a temptation for people to say, you know, like, I'm a product manager, I'm a marketing manager, I don't have an MFA, I'm never going to know the nuances of color theory, uh, to the extent that, you know, designers might. So look, I'm just going to put together this quick chart, it'll be fine. How would you approach that? I mean, obviously, there's you know, in an ideal world, we would know everything about this, but in, in this day to day where we're often rushing, putting out fires, how should we, or how could people approach visualizing without, um, without worrying about getting a degree, you know, like that much information? Yeah. One of the questions you, you get in the space is, well, like you said, either I'm not creative. Mm -hmm. I, I can't make charts like that, but the point isn't to be creative. Actually, the point is to be as simple as possible. Because the more creative 
you try to be ends up making things more cluttered. You end up having things that you don't need because you're trying to make it look cool or fancy. Mm -hmm. And we work with clients to actually do the minimum as possible. One, to save time, but two, things start interfering with each other. So you use the example of color. So color is really a, a big area and it's not, doesn't take much to understand what you have to do because if you just do the minimum, that's better. So for example, if you start adding color as background, now you have to worry about how that background color might interfere with the colors that you use on your charts. Okay, well, if you don't use a background color, which really isn't necessary, you don't have to worry about it. If you only use a couple colors, then you don't have to worry about colors interfering with each other. Another big thing we see is because people just use the defaults that the software throws out, what happens is you might create two charts and put those on the same pay dashboard or page, mm -hmm. but the software has chosen its default colors and they end up being the same colors, say, but for different meanings. So now let's say you have blue and orange on two charts, but they mean completely different things, but now they're shown on the same page. So naturally you assume, well, blue must be related. They must be the same, but they're not. And so that messes up your brain and how you think about things and it slows down the conversation. And so simple, there's very simple rules of grammar like that. If you can teach people, they can avoid them. And then again, about saying color theory, you don't need to know color theory. Uh, one, because most software comes with pretty good co color mixes or palettes, but also companies can just say, look, here's the colors that you should use for visualization. Uh, most companies don't have that set up. And then what people do is they like to use the colors in the corporate logo, hmm. which were not designed for visualization. They were designed for something else, marketing or some other emotional theme that they wanted to get across, right? So those logos might be perfect for that need, but completely awful hmm. for visualization. But people don't think that way. They're just like, well, it's, I'm presenting to my company or my client. I'll just use the corporate colors. And so again, simple things that people can do. It takes some work. But if you know those, some rules like that, you can really, you don't need to be a color, color theorist or, or, or anything special like that. Yeah, that, that makes me think of, you know, something we, I just, I guess I assumed starting this conversation is that, you know, visualization is important. Organizations should spend a little bit more time, most, most of them, improving the way that they organize information visually. But maybe like ju jumping back to that really big picture, why is visualization important and why, especially for organizations that are using data, what does it, what are the stakes involved when we're dealing with data visualization? Yeah. I mean, data visualization is not new, right? It's been around for hundreds of years. I think it's really the last 10 years that the software has evolved and computers have been able to handle that the, the processing of the graphics and then the growth of the volume of data. Mm -hmm. okay, so those three things have happened. So there's kind of the need with the, the volume of data and then the ability to, to handle it with the software and the, and the computing. If you're living today in a world of trying to look at information in a spreadsheet, you can only look at a very small amount of, of information in a spreadsheet. And it takes a long time to do that. I used to work for a company and every Friday there was a sales meeting and the person running the meeting would show up with a spreadsheet. It wasn't big. I'll just say maybe it was like 20 by 20. So that's 400 data points. And they would say, as you can see, the trend is. And the only reason that they knew that there was a trend in there is because they'd studied it before. Mm. Like they didn't come, but I, I, it was all fresh to me. I, I don't see a trend. I don't, you know, and, and, and that's the trouble you get into. And of course, that's just a small amount of information. And so the whole point of data visualization really today is to one, be able to connect, you know, to see that data rapidly, to see a large amount of data rapidly. But I think also it's evolved with the interaction, right? So now it's set up. So if I can see one piece of information and that interests me, if someone has built it in the right way to kind of lead me through the, being able to read the story, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. then I can do that, right? So static imagery, a, a, a spreadsheet or just a chart that's been copied and pasted doesn't give you that either. So modern data visualization has those elements of letting people explore if it's designed well uh, with these kind of basic rules in mind that we've been talking about. And hopefully we're also 
reducing the amount that has to be built, right? If you have to build hundreds of charts and tables and like you used to, right, to make a deck, it took a lot of effort and a lot of time. And you, by the time you finished the monthly report, you had to do, you know, start, it was the end of the month and you started the next yeah. one. Right? <laughs> and now that all of that's been reduced too. So the load on people and, and that changing that amount of work so that you're doing less of that menial task and hopefully freeing up that time to actually do the analysis. It's getting closer, but people still spend a lot of time working with the data, massaging the data. You hear that quote all the time, right? Yeah. We spend 80% of our time getting the data ready and only have 20% to analyze it. And it's probably not even 20% because you're still doing other work too. So you're trying to shift to flip that, right? Where you're spending 80% of the time analyzing and, and 20% doing the, the, the back end work with it. Yeah. And that, that makes me think too, what, what would you say are some of the markers or, or ways of distinguishing organizations that are doing it well and those that aren't? I mean, obviously there's a, is a, as you've already said, you can understand the meaning of a graphic quicker. You can hopefully uh, have a shared understanding much more easily. But if you were to talk about, you know, this organization and these kinds of organizations are really doing data visualization well, and these aren't, and here is the repercussion of it. What would you, how would you describe that in general? That's a really interesting question. I'm not sure I have a specific answer for it, but I'll, I'll kind of give you some, some thoughts that are coming to mind. A lot of times what I do with clients first, when they come to me, right, because they think they need help, mm -hmm. but I don't presuppose that they do. So we talk, you know, I kind of get a sense of what's going on there. And then I ask, you know, just, Hey, just show me some of your work. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes what they have might be better than they think, or it could be worse, right? They might, they might be worse off and they don't, they, they don't realize that either. And so to me, that's a quick gauge because I can base, and then, I, then, then we can get into a discussion also about, are you getting to where you need to be, right? Because going back to that idea of making decisions and, and taking action from, from that, they could have, let's say they have the, they show me something and I just, I'm shaking my head and saying, I can't believe that this is what they're working with. But then they were to tell me that they are hitting all their goals with this and, and management has been able to, to make certain investment decisions or product decisions and, and they all turned out great. I might say, well, if your business is running that well, that's great. Maybe there's a different thing we need to work on. Or maybe now it's not a fix me, it's an improve me situation, mm -hmm. even if their stuff is bad, right? It's okay. You're doing great based off of something that I don't think is really good. We could look into that and see what's going on. So now how do we take that to the next level? Where could you get? So it changes the discussion too. So, and usually it's not, that's not the case, right? Usually it's, they're worse than they think they are. <laughs> Just because it's they don't have us, they don't have anything to gauge it off of either, right? They're not mm, really seeing point. necessarily what their competitors are doing or what even other companies are doing. You might see some things here and there, right? You go to a conference or things like that, but most you don't see. So it's really hard to know. You know, and the companies that are doing it well, they're not sharing it. So you know, what does theirs look like? And again, what works for one company may not work for another either. Because it all has to be based on your, your strategy, even companies in the same industry, right? They have different strategies about how they do it. Coke and Pepsi make the same kind of product, but how they go about it, not technically making it, but how they market it and how they run their companies are, are quite different. Mm -hmm. And so maybe their dashboards and their analytics and visualizations would look completely different than one another. Yeah, well, and that's a good point, right? I think I think the temptation is, and the reason why people don't necessarily improve their data viz is that they think it's an aesthetic choice. You know, yes, it could be prettier, but I don't have time for that. I, what I care about is strategy. So how does data visualization tie in more closely, like the decisions you make with visualization? How can we think of that from, you know, a strategic standpoint or a decision standpoint? How does that relate as opposed to... I don't, I don't care about how pretty the chart is. I want to be able to make a decision. How does data visualization relate to that? Yeah. In, in fact, it all has to start with the business strategy. So think about going back to the idea of it being a product. Mm -hmm. So if you came to me and said, Lee, I need X, Y, and Z, get me, get me that. 
I would want to find out why you want me to build that product for you. I mean, you're not necessarily prescribing how it should look, although that does happen. People say, I want this and I want it to look this way too, right? Even though they have no expertise in visualization at all, right? They, they dictate what it should look like. So that's a whole, that's a whole nother issue you have to wrestle with, right? So if you just say, well, get it for me or just make it, mm -hmm. right? I don't. Right. And so that's one thing we work on with our, with clients say, look, if you, if you're in that mode, you know, if you go off and just try to make this for somebody without really having any understanding about why they're even there and they don't have time to talk to you about it, if they're just in a hurry, right. You're doomed. <laughs> you're, you're just going to waste a lot of time and you're going to be very frustrated when you go back to them. And you know, they're going to say, that's not what I want. And you're going to say to them, but that's what you asked me for. Okay. Which is not the same thing. So you have to teach people to get out of that mode of reacting, or some people call it order taking, mm -hmm. where you really have to, to find out from somebody why, right? And so I'm going to want to know from you, well, why, what, what prompted you to come and ask me to, to do this? And if you had it, what would you do with it? Mm -hmm. What kind of decisions are you trying to make? How would you even know to make a decision from it and, and start getting into that conversation? And it's, it's kind of this thing where you hear people say, oh, just ask good questions. That's, that's the key to being a good analyst or good visualization, good analytics. But that's hard. And so we actually teach people how to ask those questions, not just what questions to ask by trying to give them some kind of scripts, almost like sales scripts. Mm -hmm. But teaching them culturally, because part of it, well, I can't ask my, if it, let's say it's, you're my boss, right? Well, I could never say that to my boss. I just have to do it. It's like, no, you have to say that because again, you know, the outcome for you is not good. And then for the outcome for them is not good either. And so you, we literally force them through this role play in a safe, to safe environment, right? We're, we're all friends there and say, oh no, get up there and do it, right? It's not just me saying, ask good questions. We're going to do this and you're going to see what it feels like mm -hmm. to do it and get some practice. And so it gives them that very textured feeling of, of, yes, they can say it and they have to do it. It's not really optional to be successful anymore. And there's more and more of the work around analytics and visualization is really, it truly is cultural. You hear people say data culture again, it's kind of a vague thing, but it really is about how the work gets done and the people who are doing the work have to change their behavior as well. It's not mm -hmm. technical. It's not just technical skill. Yeah. It's behavioral and interaction skills. Yeah, no, that's a great point because we talk to a lot of, you know, really smart people in the product world who are very keen to, you know, address problems, right? We, we talk about it pragmatic outside in versus inside out, right? If you mm -hmm. are thinking of it as, you know, I like this chart or whatever, or I like this product even worse, right? That doesn't necessarily mean anything if you're trying to design a product that will sell to a certain market or whatever. But yeah, that doesn't necessarily translate into why are you making this chart, which, you know, sounds like it actually aligns really well with the whole uh, way that we teach people to do product or use product thinking. I think it also, you know, you have this 21 titles that turn your Tableau charts into data stories that's available on your website. I think we're going to have a uh, show notes that, that'll link to it, but um, it seems to tie in with that kind of approach, right? Do you want to say a little bit about what content you've put in there? Yeah, sure. So the first thing I'll say, it works whether you have Tableau or not. Yeah. So it's, it's still a good, good read and it's a short read, but it goes back to this idea of being very practical, right? Asking questions. So I said, I'm just going to give people a short guide on how they can start doing that. So it's literally takes you through some typical kind of case studies about the, the way you might set up your, your work and how to frame it as a question. So why are the questions important? So there's another aspect to that. If you look at most dashboards or charts today that, that are out there, they have titles like trends, sales month over month, profit, right? There, it's barely a statement, but it's a, let's call those statements, right? Mm -hmm. This is the sales trend. And one thing is it's vague. 
It's not specific about what's on there. And depending on who the reader is, they will have their own interpretation of what they think they're going to see next. So instead, we get people to write very specific questions. So instead, instead of just trends, it might say, what were the sales trends for this product? Or are sales greater than profit for this period? Or whatever the question is going to be. And that way, it does a couple things. One, it's this notion I said of intent before content, right? So it's, I, I get a very specific idea about what the, that I'm going to see. And questions put you in a different frame of mind than that statement. So when I see a question, my brain naturally automatically goes into this curiosity mode, mm -hmm. right? So it gets me thinking about it in a different way. And it's very specific rather than sales trends. Sales trends is like, okay, whatever. Now yeah. I'm like, I, I'm, I'm faced with a very specific question in my mind. And it, again, it's like tuning into the message. And so it's, it's not just a semantic thing about changing the words. It's, it's very purposeful in how you're, you're interacting with your audience and how you want them to react to what you're showing them. If your organization wants to leverage data to drive success, explore Pragmatic Institute's training offerings. We provide individuals and teams with actionable guidance, hands-on practice, and a business-oriented approach so that they can solve problems and propel decision-making with data. Find out more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. Yeah, I like that a lot. It makes me think actually about some issues that you might come across when you're first teaching this, I would imagine, where people might try to go too deeply into causations when really what they're doing is describing something, how do you work with that? The difference between sort of like the expectation that you can predict or you can say why this happened versus you can say what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that gets into really a whole big area about just analytics in general, right? Mm -hmm. That's not really about the chart. That's about being a good analyst, right? To know whether, Hey, this is just a fact that I'm putting out, I'm showing you something, but I'm, I'm showing it to you in a way that is meant to be again, very targeted. Or if I truly know that it is cause and effect or what, whatever message again, I'm trying to get across, then I would show it that way too. So it always goes back to the communication. What do I want you to see? If I really think that I can show that it is related, then I have to figure out the right way to show the visual. Now, the other thing I'll just touch on, because we're talking about this product idea too. The other thing that this, this model of intent before content allows is for some innovation. And I'll give you an exa uh, example. So what most people do, right, when you're making a chart, again, the software usually has some kind of chart chooser, right? It has a list, you can pick from it. Mm -hmm. So that's what people do. They go, which chart do I want? And let's just assume they pick a chart that is good. But what they're limited to is what they know at the moment. They just pick those charts. But if you think about what would the ideal chart look like to get my point across, and maybe you just sketch it out. When, when you get good enough at using a particular piece of software, you usually learn some, I'll call them like magic incantations, or you can call them hacks or whatever you want. Basically, you learn how to do some advanced things in the software to make it do what you want it to do. And I'm not talking about coding or anything like that. It's just kind of understanding the way the software behaves. And so what that lets you do is create some charts that you might not have created if you just picked what the software gave you kind of out of the box, because you've thought about, wow, this is the best way, or maybe you get 90% of it, but you're, but you're changing the game because you're really putting the effort. You know, it's like being a good author of if you're writing something well, you're putting the effort into really thinking about, hey, I'm not just going to keep writing. I'm going to, I'm going to write so it reflects my ideas in a good way and paints a picture for people so they can really get a, an idea of, of what the landscape, you know, the landscape of my story looks like, you know, Stephen King and all these mm. people who write so in a way where you can almost see everything around you. So that's a key part, again, about thinking about it as product. It's like you get into this innovation phase, which, which you couldn't otherwise. Yeah. What, would you have any thoughts on iteration of charts? I mean, I know that if 
if somebody's planning a Friday meeting and it's Thursday, they're not going to go through it a bunch of times, but it makes me think about the writing process, right? I mean, in my experience, the, the best writing comes not from the writing process it's from the editing process, right? Where you, mm-hmm. you, you know, you try it, but your first draft is never your final draft. If you're a good writer, what about charts or visualizations? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. It just depends who you want the editor to be. And it can be, you know, it can be lots of people. But one thing we teach is to actually stay away from the software as long as possible. Hmm. Again, a lot of people think data first. So they get the data, they hook up to it, they just have at it with and start making things. And that gets you, can get you into a lot of trouble. Sometimes though, the fact is you don't even have the data. And so some people can't even start. Well, I have to wait for the data. So our, again, our model is more like, well, you can start sketching out some ideas. When I say sketch, I mean rough, really rough sketch, actually. You don't want to do a detailed sketch, but you want it to be enough where I could come in and, and let's say again, like you're my management. We've had this discussion already. I think I have some ideas. I put it down on paper. It's very simple. I come to you and show it to you and walk you through it. I don't say, do you like this? I just kind of I explain, hey, does this make sense? Does this reflect what you and I talked about? And you might have some questions and that's kind of the editing mode. And it's not meant to take a long time. I mean, you don't have to spend, you can sketch something in 10 minutes. I mean, it's not, you're not trying to be Picasso here. You're actually trying to draw more like a kindergartner. Yeah. In fact, we teach people to draw with Sharpies because you can't do a lot of detail with Sharpies because it's like really fat tip, right? So you almost forces you to not get into too much. And so that's that that editing process where you can put the ideas down quickly, go show it to somebody. It could be your management. It could be your neighbor, someone on your team, someone on a different team. Just say, look, if I showed this to you out of the box, would you get this? Right. And they might have some some simple questions. It also prevents you from digging in the software because once you're in the software, then you start worrying about colors and placement and fonts and all this stuff that has nothing to do with the guts of what you're trying to get at. So you end up fiddling and wasting time on all this stuff that's not important at the moment. So it actually, we find you can do your work faster by going through this, where a lot of people say, I don't have time to do that. I just have to get in the software. It ends up taking less time going through this approach. It's more agile, you know, like, you know, so it adopts that kind of agile, that's where the agile stuff comes in from product development into this model. So having experience with that, again, kind of makes us a bit unique thinking about your, the way you do the work. Yeah. That makes me think you've also, I mean, you've given some great tips already. I wonder, you know, in your years or decades, even working with this kind of stuff, what improvements have you made? What changes have you made? So it sounds like, you know, I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but maybe where you might have started with a yearly chart. Now you have a very specific question. I mean, I'm going to try to start doing that in all of my work now. What else have you done along the way that uh, might, you know, save people some time through your experience? Yeah, uh, you know, I started like everybody else because I didn't know anything. I, I only knew what was there or what mm-hmm. I, or what I thought was good, or, yeah. right? And as I did the work and started to think about it more, I just had these, I had questions I had to answer, not the kind of questions we talked about. I just had thoughts like there's got to be a better way. Mm -hmm. Or why is this so chaotic? Why is it such a mess? Why can't we do this better? And I just started challenging it. And that's kind of where all this started to evolve. I think the, the, I know this is going to sound a little bit simple, but one of the things I, I, I force people on is this red, green, yellow thing Mm. that everybody uses, which is a, a lot of it's a holdover from any kind of management experience. It was big in Excel, right? I'm going to color my, my boxes, red, green, and yellow, right? Red is bad. Yellow's okay. And green is good. And there's a big problem with that. I'm, I know, I'm sure people have heard this term colorblindness. And now it's really called color vision deficiency because people who have trouble seeing the difference between red and green, which is the most common thing, if you have trouble with colors, mm. can actually see other colors. So they're not actually colorblind. It's just that they have trouble with certain things. Now, some people might just not be able to see color at all, but so it doesn't even really represent what's going on. So 
to me, that's a big thing because it's actually among men, it's it's pretty common. It's like 8% of the male population has this as a problem, that particular instance. So that's a lot. So if you think about the world of data visualization growing, then you have to address this problem, right? You, you're going to proliferate it even more and more. And you don't even need yellow because yellow is like, don't even look at this, right? Because yellow means it's okay. So you don't even need it, it should be white. So you really need like green, white, and something else, orange or blue and orange. So that's an area companies need to talk about is how do we wanna standardize what this means? And so that's a, I would say that's one thing that's, uh, that I've thought about a lot. And, and, and if you're in finance, I always say you can go with like black and red because it actually has a literal meaning. You're in the black, you're in the red. So that, that people understand that. So that's an area I've worked a lot on with people and then I waging my war against pie charts. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like, you know, anyone who's in it professionally ha often has something against pie charts. What is it? <laughs> there's a couple of things. So there's probably more than a couple. Yeah. We don't have time. For, <laughs> there's there's a, few, a few things that are simple. So the first one is in most software, you have very little control over the sizing of the pie chart. So what happens is it ends up taking up way more space on the screen than you need. So I'm very stingy because you want to maximize the space for everything that you have. And so literally that's a problem because you have the pie chart and then you have all this white space around it. So that's one problem. So that's just more of a technical you know, application thing. And then most people just don't understand that once you get above a certain number of slices on the pie chart, right? it's hard to really distinguish mm -hmm. what's on them. So they say, well, that's why we need color and that's why we need labels, right? But what does all that make you do? All of that makes you have to study the pie chart. So if two, two pot slices look similar, now I have to read the label to know if they're similar or not. Well, that's extra work and I'm lazy and most people are lazy. And the point of the visualization is to make it take less time, not more time. Yeah. So you're doing things that force you to do exactly the opposite of what you're trying to achieve. So that's really my biggest gripe with pie charts most of the time. And then because you have all those colors, like I said before, you have the interference. So now if I've used all yeah. those colors up, I can't use them somewhere else unless they mean the same thing. So there's kind of technical implications with the spacing. There's the interpretation. And then there's some of the, again, the grammar issues about how you do things and how you can use color. So there's a lot to pie charts beyond just saying they're not good. You know, it's again, it's easy to say they're not good, but mm -hmm. like, you, you know, that's why I wanted to, ex, you know, expand on your, your question a little bit more too, to get into that. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And then also I never realized until recently that it effectively tells people that it's a zero sum issue, right? So you can only, it's always about a hundred percent. So anytime you raise something, it looks like you're taking away from others. And that's not necessarily the case in a lot of the, a lot of these. Right. Well, yeah. it's only a hundred percent if you do it the right way. Cause I've seen them, some that go above a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, and then that's a whole other thing. Yeah. <laughs> so pie charts, be very cautious if you are going to use them at all. What I, more, more specifically, let's say people listening to this, are at an organization where they think they might be able to, you know, push a little bit against the culture to make it, to improve it, right? If they were going to go into the office the next day after listening to this, what are two key things that they might be able to do? Sort of very practical after listening to you, after hopefully learning more, you know, checking out your work, which I'll ask you about in a, in a minute, where to find you, what can they do tomorrow to help improve that organizational culture, especially around data literacy? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is to, to ask that question of why they want it. Again, thinking about it, if, if, if you're my audience, you're my customer, finding out what's on your mind. And it doesn't have to be obnoxious, right? It's, it's just, mm -hmm. hey, something like, it's not a problem to get the data for that. And I, I know we can make some good looking dashboards, but just could we spend a couple of minutes talking about why you thought about it in the first place? And when you have it in hand, what are the, the, the kinds of, the decisions you would be trying to make and ultimately what even actions would you be trying to, to make from this? If you could have any part of that conversation with somebody, you'd be making a big personal step because you'd be breaking some of your bad habits and you starting to 
change the dynamics in the organization. And that's really going to help that mm. that's, that's the biggest thing ultimately, I think. And then starting to think about the, I, you know, what am I trying to really do with this chart? That idea of the intent before content. So even if you make, you don't make the best chart from it. I think if you start to narrow in on what you're really trying to communicate and be specific about it, rather than just month, you know, sales month over month. Yeah. You know, that should change into something like did sales change more than 2% in any month, right? Now I'm, I've nailed it. I know exactly what I'm trying to show and that's going to affect how I design. And if I don't do the best job designing it, at least I'm closer. I think those are two, two big areas where you can start to make a big difference that will people will, it makes it visible to other people and they can start to see that you're changing your process and, and it forces people to react to it also. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Cause I was just imagining, you know, if somebody starts doing this at their organization and people see the difference it makes, then it, it just becomes a domino effect. I, I can, I can totally see that happening. And so, no, I love it when we get this kind of practical advice we can go and do, I'm going to do this stuff. I'm going to try to do this stuff after talking to you myself, for people who want to learn more about you or follow your work, where do you suggest they check? Yeah. So you can go to decision viz, V I Z dot com. There's lots of information there. Also, if you just want to grab the, the, the short read ebook that, that Chris mentioned, you can just get that at question your data.com slash data chats. Perfect. What about you directly? Anything, any, any best contact inf information? Should they do it through the website if they want to? Uh, talk yeah, to no, more? I'm up on LinkedIn. You can find Lee Feinberg. Uh, Twitter is decision, all, all the social media, it's decision yeah. viz. I've been around long enough. I <laughs> grabbed all that early, early on. So nice. yeah, so you can find me out there and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty active on, on I'm most active on LinkedIn. Perfect. Well, no, Lee, this has been great. You know, it's, uh, we've only gotten to cover just a sliver of the, I know the stuff that you're interested in and that you're doing, but already I feel like I hope my visualizations, my presentations will have improved and I'm sure for listeners, it'll be the same. So and that's what I hope. Yeah. That's what I'm here for. I hope everybody gets, you know, starts getting better and, and we need to, 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 yeah. to tackle what's coming. Exactly. It's not new anymore. We need to improve because this is just a part of life now and you know, part of every organization has to be thinking about data visualization. So yeah, thank you so much for joining this episode of Data Chats. I really appreciated uh, your time, Lee, and uh, I look forward to, to following your work and seeing more. Yeah, excellent. Thanks again. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of Data Chats. And to our listeners, you can harness the power of your organization's data with Pragmatic Institute's newest course, Data Science for Business Leaders. Partner with data professionals to uncover business value, make informed decisions, and solve problems. The upcoming open enrollment session of DS for BL runs from May 23rd to 24th, or speak to our sales team about scheduling a private training tailored to your team's needs. Learn more at pragmaticinstitute.com slash data. <laughs>